Okay, you all, good evening and uh, welcome to our Word to the Wise series, which uh, is, uh, this is our final week, uh, our, our third week, and we're going to be covering the book of Proverbs. And so I'm going to stay on here for a bit. We had a, a little bit of trouble logging on uh, through Zoom and uh, the link that was supposed to connect us to Facebook didn't work. So I've just logged on directly through Facebook Live, and I hope some more of you are able to join us as we uh, crack open some scripture uh, this evening, and as we, again, look at the book of Job, uh, our final book in our wisdom literature series. So uh, a couple of announcements before we launch into studying the book of Job. Uh, you have been made aware, I'm sure, that we're starting in-person public worship this upcoming Sunday. Uh, first, we'll have a, a service on Saturday evening, actually, at five o'clock, and that will be outside, just kind of in between the Memorial Garden and behind the Miller Room. It's in a shaded area, and so if you're planning on coming to that, the five o'clock service on Saturday, uh, do plan to bring your lawn chair, And um, but we will have a service of, of communion. We will come to you and it will be, in that sense, similar to our services in the nave the next morning. We have one at 8 Sunday morning and another at 10. For all of these services, we'll have social distancing in place, and uh, people will be asked to wear masks uh, per the bishop's directives and CDC guidelines. Uh, we want to be abundantly safe, as safe as humanly possible. And so uh, we ask you to sign up if you've not already signed up. Our 10 o'clock service, by the way, will be streamed, and so you can join us uh, that way. If you do not feel safe coming to church or are unable to make it, do know that you can still worship with us virtually at 10 o'clock, and that will be streamed to our website and also uh, through Facebook. One other thing that you might be interested to know uh, that we've been working on for a bit, um, Amy Talbot, our communications person, has created uh, two podcasts for our sermons. And this just makes them more accessible for you, uh, easier to get your hands on, um, as opposed to having to log into our website. Um, you can actually uh, subscribe to podcasts and those will automatically populate in your, your podcast, either through uh, iTunes or through Spotify. And so, while you're out um, rowing or riding your bike or running uh, or on the road, maybe you're traveling and you're unable to join us, do know that we now have our sermons available via podcast, Spotify and iTunes. And if you want to suffer through watching one of my sermons or listening to it rather, then you now can do that um, more easily than ever. And then finally, this upcoming year, uh, the program year, we are preparing for in various ways, but what I'm most excited about is that we're going to be launching small groups and really pushing this um, at St. Francis in the Fields. And this is a way for us to develop pockets of community that in some ways are pandemic proof. And um, you may already be a part of a small group or maybe you've been a part of one before, but we're going to be sending out more information about what it looks like for you to participate in one of these small groups. I would really encourage you to seriously consider this. You know, when Jesus started his public ministry, he started a small group. He gathered 12 disciples around him and they did life together for three years and it changed the world. I know my life has been changed through small groups. I know of many people, um, even many uh, recently that I've been in small groups with whose lives have been dramatically changed. And so I encourage you to sign up when that information is made available. And so just be aware that we will be doing that. So uh, today, um, this evening, as we cover the book of Job, uh, I want to do a kind of broad overview of the book, just to give you a sense of what's going on. I mean, it's a fairly long book in some ways. I mean, compared to what we were covering last week, it's not as long as Ecclesiastes. And uh, it's a powerful book and a profound and beautiful book. So we're not going to be able to touch on all of the details, but we're going to do a kind of 10,000 foot view. And then what I would encourage you to do is over the next several weeks, 
do a deeper dive into uh, the book of Job. And you might remember that, um, you know, our first week for the Word to the Wise series, we covered Proverbs. And Proverbs, in essence, is uh, a book of Proverbs, uh, of, of wisdom sayings, of uh, divine wisdom uh, made accessible to us uh, from God through a human author. And um, it generally gives guidelines for how to live the good life. That is the truly good life, the life that is rooted in the author and source of all goodness, God himself. Um, so if that's in a very simplistic sense what Proverbs is about, Ecclesiastes, uh, by way of review, comes along and says, well, actually, um, there is another side to the story. It's complementary. It's not contradictory. But Ecclesiastes uh, tries to provide a dose of realism simply by saying that, you know, uh, things don't always work out the way that Proverbs envisions. At least in human experience, very often, um, you know, uh, the, the good die young, as it were, and the righteous uh, don't get what seems to be um, fair results in their, in their lives and suffer uh, tremendously. And uh, life is a vapor, it seems futile, everything under the sun is, is like smoke. We try to grasp onto it, but it's lost before we can even really get it in our hands. So that's what Ecclesiastes is about. And at the end, if you remember from our time last week, it pulls back from the perspective of the teacher or the preacher, uh, Kohelet, and then it gives the view of the author that um, second person in the book who says, you know, if life were only lived under the sun, that is, if life were lived without God in the picture, then it truly would be futility. But in fact, there is a God. And, um, and, and, and that's where it ends. It, uh, it, it um, drives towards uh, this vision of wisdom that, to be sure, it, it, it's good to name suffering for what it is as a kind of missing of the mark for what we were designed to experience. And yet it doesn't leave us in that place uh, without hope. And so in many ways, it is a, a, a gospel book. It is um, proclaiming that we are not without hope because we don't merely live under the sun, but we live under the providential care of God. And so now today we are getting into the book of Job just a beautiful book. Job comes after Esther and just before the Psalms in your Bible. If you have a Bible, I would encourage you to pull that out. And this is really a unique book in the Bible. The setting is in a place called Uz, which is far away from Israel. Uh, all the characters in the book are non-Israelites, and there's no real clear historical setting. And in fact, all of that is intentional. Because the point seems to be that the author wants to focus us, the reader, on the questions which are raised by Job's suffering. This is very much a relevant text for those who suffer, uh, who struggle, who deal with uh, horror or tragedy. Um, this is the book <laughs> that speaks to that, along with other books, of course, but but, but this has a sharper edge to it in terms of addressing suffering, even though it doesn't provide perhaps the answers that we would want, and it doesn't get around uh, the issue of suffering um, or through the issue of suffering in the way that we would imagine. So it is a unique book. It is dealing with questions related to suffering, but then it's going deeper and landing us ultimately at the feet of the God who is wise and who is faithful and whom we can trust. Okay, so let's start at the beginning of the book and we will move forward. So the book opens in the prologue uh, with an, a narrative prologue, chapters one through two, talking about, on the one hand, Job's character, and also, on the other hand, talking about his great wealth. Job is a very rich man, right? He has all kinds of uh, 
of animals, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys. And so this was a, uh, this was a very wealthy man. He had a big family, seven sons and three daughters. And, um, you know, it's interesting. He talks about how his sons used to go and hold a feast. And ultimately, he gets to the point that he would pray for them every day. I think he was a little worried about the kinds of parties that they were throwing. But it says that this Job was the greatest of all the people of the East. Now, this is all, this phrase is also used of uh, Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 4. So here Job is presented as really uh, a blameless man, a righteous man, and a man who honors God. Uh, so that's not, um, uh, you know, that's not just something that's made up about him. The, the, the narrative is actually uh, presenting Job in this light, that he's blameless, he's righteous, he is a man who honors God. And it shifts in the scene to this heavenly realm with uh, God's staff, as it were, around him. And uh, it's a kind of court scene, in essence, where um, there is a prosecutor, the Satan, mentioned here in chapter 1. And in fact, Satan, the Satan, um, that word in the Hebrew means accuser or prosecutor. And so, again, it's a kind of court scene. And essentially, um, you know, uh, Job is, is, is presented as this really kind of awesome guy. And Satan comes along and says, well, he wouldn't be so awesome if you, you know, allowed me to mistreat him or you mistreated him. Um, if you took away everything that he had, he basically says, listen, uh, God, Job is only righteous because you reward him, but let him suffer and see how righteous he is then. Well, God um, <laughs> it's interesting. God is the one who says, have you considered my servant Job, who is uh, righteous? God uses the word righteous of Job, because remember uh, in the chapter, Satan, the Satan, has been roaming the earth to and fro, finding someone who, uh, trying to find someone at least who is righteous that he can persecute. So, so God puts Job forward, which is quite interesting. And why? Why does this happen? I think that uh, we assume that the book will ultimately answer this, and it really doesn't. Um, and there is this deeper question around that, which is, why does God allow Job to suffer? Why does God put forward Job as a candidate for Satan's prosecutorial work? Job loses everything, his family, he loses everything that he owns, his wealth, he has boils on his skin. I mean, he really goes through quite a lot. And so the real question that emerges is, is God just? And does he run a world that has justice at its center? So the response to these questions um, come out again and again throughout the book. Now, uh, it's interesting because Job has uh, three friends who come along and they try to explain away his suffering. Uh, these I've heard often um, referred to as his seminary friends, right? Those who have studied theology just enough, uh, but perhaps don't have a lot of real life experience, who think they know the answers and they can just kind of throw out a textbook um, line that somehow uh, penetrates to the core of human suffering and in fact it doesn't even begin to do that. So Job, of course, is not very happy with them. But these three men are not Israelites. Uh, it's Eliphaz, the the uh, Tamanite, Bildad, the, the Shuhite, and Zophar, the Naamanthite. Uh, so three great names. Uh, <laughs> I encourage you to name any of your children after that. And what they represent is the, be the best of ancient Near Eastern thought. And so they seem to be um, trying to answer how on earth Job could be suffering this seemingly righteous man, and yet their answers come up short every time. Job is just sitting there in ashes, having lost everything. This is an incredibly tough predicament. Even his wife in the story tells Job to curse God and die. So this is quite an intensive, uh, an, an intensive situation that he's experiencing. 
Okay, so the questions that are really flashing like a neon light throughout the text are, number one, is God just? Number two, does God run the universe on the strict principle of justice? And number three, how is Job's suffering to be explained? Now, interestingly, there is a big assumption, I think, that Job is operating upon, and it's essentially this, that you have human action on the one hand, and you have God's justice on the other. So if you are wise and good, that will lead to success and reward. If you're evil and stupid, that will lead to disaster and punishment. So he's operating on this assumption, and yet his experience is, is demonstrating that that is not true. So his whole worldview has been rocked to the core. Now, Job begins to kind of shake his hand at God in chapters 3 through 37. We have dense Hebrew poetry in these chapters. And Job is making an argument. Remember, it's a court scene. So he's saying, God, I'm innocent. And in fact, he, uh, I think within what he says, is buying into an implication, which is that his suffering is not divine justice. Even as he's accusing God, he knows that he has not yet done anything. And so I guess he must accuse God. And so his first conclusion is that God doesn't run the world according to justice. And then his second conclusion is, or maybe God is just unjust. Now, his friends, that is his three theologian friends, uh, come along and they represent ancient Near Eastern wisdom. And they know that God, by definition, cannot be unjust. So, in fact, the problem must not be with God, but with Job. Because God is just and God runs the world according to justice. Therefore, Job must have sinned, right? And then we have also this other person who will come along named Elihu, uh, but we'll get to him in a moment. Now, Job's protest throughout uh, these chapters, chapters 3 through 37, um, demonstrate that he is on an emotional roller coaster, as any of us would be if we had gone through what Job has experienced. Let me just read a few verses to you. In chapter 27, verse 2, Job is saying, why has God denied me justice and made my life bitter? This is a visceral kind of gut reaction. Chapter 16, verse 9, he says, God attacks me, tears me up in anger, and gnashes his teeth at me. Now, of course, we know as the reader that it's Satan who's doing this. But Job is blaming God. Chapter 9, verses 22 through 23, he destroys the blameless and the wicked. He mocks the despair of the innocent. All right, so he envisions God as mocking him from heaven. And then chapter 27, 8, Job just simply saying in despair, what hope do the godless have when God takes away their life? So this is an intense existential struggle that he's going through. But we get to Job's uh, final statement in chapters 29 through 31, where he, he asserts his innocence and he demands an explanation from God, kind of, you know, uh, waving his fist in heaven. In fact, verse 31 through 35, or uh, chapter 31, verse 35, he says, I sign my defense. Remember, it's a court scene. I sign my defense. Let the Almighty answer me. Okay. So the question becomes then, how will God answer him? <laughs> how will God uh, provide his defense in this court scene? Now, briefly, in chapters 32 through 37, we do see another kind of surprise friend pop up. And this is Elihu, um, who draws a more sophisticated conclusion. He doesn't know why Job suffers, but he knows that Job shouldn't accuse God. He likewise believes that God is just and that God runs the world according to justice. But his conclusion is that suffering may be a warning to avoid future sin because it builds character. 
Now, we're not told if that's true or not. This is simply the opinion of one of his other friends. But again, Job has given his defense. He has raised his hand, his fist to the heavens, and has accused God. How will God answer? That's where we are in the text, chapters 38 through 41. And what does God say? What does God do? He takes Job on a virtual tour of the universe, right? He says things like, where were you when I laid the earth, earth's foundation? And he gives this kind of cosmological uh, tour of uh, lightning and sunshine and and rams and and lions and 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 land you know uh, other animals uh, features within his creation just how complex everything is uh, job's assumption again is that uh, if you live a wise and good life you'll uh, find success and reward and if you're evil and stupid you'll uh, experience disaster and punishment god is problematizing that simplistic understanding, right? Job thinks that he has enough perspective to make such a claim about ultimate reality and to ultimately accuse God. But in fact, we know that Job's perspective is limited. <laughs> We've had this entire heavenly scene that Job has no access to. And in fact, Job is finite. He is a human, right? And like so many of us, Job is scooping foam off the edge of a wave and thinking that he has captured the ocean. And in fact, he's nowhere even close. Job does not have a universal vantage point. And so the conclusion seems to be that Job is not in a position to accuse God. And in fact, God says to Job, would you like to run the world? after he gives this whole litany of the complexity. But then he takes a deeper dive into two animals, the behemoth and the leviathan. And he basically says, listen, these animals, they're not evil, but they're not safe either. And this is just how creation is. It's complex, isn't it, Job? <laughs> Would you want to run the world? These are symbols of disorder and danger. So the question again pops up. Why is there suffering in the world? And the response throughout this part of the narrative seems to be, well, from God, we live in an amazing world that is not designed to prevent suffering. So it's not the answer that we would want. It's not the answer that Job wants. Job is saying, you are unjust, and I demand an explanation. And God says in response, you are not in a position to make that claim, and I simply invite you to trust, to trust my wisdom. That's God's response. And then we see Job respond with humility. He says, oh, I retract. I retract my, my prosecution against you. I repent. And then God says, listen, Job, you've spoken rightly about me. And by the way, as kind of a high five to Job, he does call out Job's three friends and says, listen, you three wrongly spoke about me. You really don't know what you're talking about. That is, by the way, a kind of chastisement to the ancient Near Eastern wisdom of the day. So God honors Job's struggle. God honors Job's honesty. And God honors Job's prayer. And finally, he restores Job's family and his fortunes. Now, it's important to name that he doesn't do this as a reward for Job somehow having earned this, but rather it is a gift of grace. It is a gift of grace, like salvation. So that is essentially the book <laughs> in a simplistic presentation. Um, but I don't want to leave you there. I want to talk about how this ultimately uh, invites us into understanding the gospel as we see it revealed most fully in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the image of the invisible God we hear by the time we get to the New Testament. You see, Job really is a type of Christ. Job is a righteous sufferer, a type and a foreshadow of Jesus. 
This is really quite interesting. Uh, so much of what we see being true of Jesus is true of Job, although Job is, again, only a shadow to the fullness of the light that we get in Jesus Christ. But think about it. Both Job and Jesus had everything. Both lost everything. Both Jesus and Job were tempted by Satan, right? Remember when Jesus is tempted in the wilderness? Both were falsely accused of being sinners. Both suffered, though did nothing wrong. And both remained ultimately faithful to God. Although, of course, Job had his doubts and his struggles and he, even his accusations against God. But, of course, God could handle his anger, right? In the same way that God can handle the anger that we see in the Psalms from the psalmist or can handle your anger or mine. God wants us to be in real relationship with him, not a fake relationship where we just present ourselves to him all buttoned up. God already knows what's going on in our minds and our hearts and the depths of our being. God knows us more fully than we know ourselves. And so when we go to God, we should go to him with all that we are experiencing and all of who we are in the moment. Finally, both Jesus and Job were blessed more abundantly in the end. And so Job is a book that gives us a vision of the gospel. Uh, it is a foreshadow and a type of Christ but it ultimately calls Christians into an invitation to, on the one hand, pursue humility, that we really do not have a God's eye view of everything that's going on. There's no way we possibly could, and so we need to avoid hubris and pride. On the other hand, it's not only an invitation to humility, but an invitation to trust that God, who is a good God, is wise. And this God will do what is right and what is just and what is merciful and compassionate and loving because it is in his very nature to do so. That's the book of Job in summary. So I hope that was helpful to you. I'm not going to show the video this week from the Bible Project simply because we've had some issues uh, with our technology in terms of streaming it. But um, my hope is that you have enjoyed this Word to the Wise series looking at uh, Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and Job, but that more, uh, more importantly, you'll uh, press into studying these books and you will uh, encounter divine wisdom that will uh, be, a, um, be a nourishment for your souls. So again, I've said this time and time uh, at St. Francis and elsewhere, Episcopalians, we really are not known for, uh, for being people of the book. And I hope that we can change that at St. Francis and pursue knowing these books, especially books of the Old Testament, which are so often neglected, like the wisdom literature. So with that, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And uh, I hope to see you this weekend. Don't ever hesitate to reach out to me if you need anything at all. And God bless you this day.